Life, as that ContraPoints quote goes, is basically sad. It's a phrase that stuck with me and resonates with me quite deeply. It is, of course, extremely simplistic, but I think that's the beauty of it, really. It poses a simple issue and invites us to come up with a simple solution. It's leftism in its most concentrated form and conjures up echoes of a refrain we on the left have often been faced with. Life isn't fair, that's life, etc. But, of course, we know that that's just coward centrist talk. Life is only unfair because we allow it to be. This misery we call life is the only way it is with the consent or at least the complacency of the majority of the population. But if we fight it, if we sacrifice and suffer and disobey, if we resist we can force change. Life isn't fair? Fuck that. Make it fair. Look to your heroes, men and women who fought to change the world. Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Helen Keller, Chelsea Manning, Malala Yousafzai. These are people who also told that life isn't fair, told to stand down and learn their place. They didn't listen, and as such made the world a much better place, even if that meant through struggle, assassination, and violence. And that, dear viewers, is what we're going to discuss today. Violence and the political and philosophical implications therein. First of all, we must acknowledge the Nazi in the room and answer the following questions. Is it ever justified to punch a fascist? Is it moral to oppose them with force? What about Antifa? Are they the real fascists? If you've watched any of my other videos, you can probably guess my position on this, but just to say it outright, yes, it is absolutely moral to, as the saying goes, bash the fash. The fascists are no strangers to violence, and in fact their entire ideology is based around violence towards those who do not fall within their preconceived ideas of the master race. In fact, they believe that they are the true victims, and that their violence is justified by the apparent threat that white race faces in the face of people of colour gaining power and influence and committing a white genocide, or deliberately replacing them by, shock horror, having consensual sex and starting families with white people. But ignoring for a moment the utterly fucking ridiculous things that white nationalists believe, Nazis are violent. Like, overwhelmingly they are more likely than any other group to just launch into an orgy of violence at the drop of an armband. This is well documented in the UK, from the thugs of the National Front to the BNP and now to UKIP, which has stoked racial hatred to such a point that in the wake of Brexit, hate crimes have skyrocketed because the fascists are starting to see their ideas winning, and even now it seems that UKIP is about to be usurped by the Brexit party, an even further right organisation. Even putting that aside, we have to acknowledge that the mere existence of fascism is violence, not just because the individual fascists are racist thugs, but because their ideology promotes and necessarily includes violence. Now, the fact is that almost all societies have a lot of violence from the top to the bottom, from forced deportation to the police to militaries, however, a fascist society is one of widespread systemic violence. We can look to historical examples of this, but rather than going all Godwin's law on you, I thought it might be a more valuable idea to simply take their ideology to its logical conclusion. So the main thing the modern fascist movement wants is a white ethnostate. We hear this repeated over and over again, and the big question, the elephant in the room, is always how this is achieved. It's usually at this point that we're assured that it'll be achieved as peacefully as possible. They'll just close the borders and stop any more non-whites coming in, and then encourage the remaining non-whites to go elsewhere. Now, this is already rather questionable, however, the real problems come in when we start to consider the fact that it is incredibly unlikely that 100% of non-white people will agree to just up and leave their homes and lives permanently in order to go live in a place they've never been before. If nothing else, the Windrush scandal has shown just how much of a shit show this can be, and how genuinely awful it often ends up being. But that's just if they go willingly. What happens if they don't? What happens if they fight back, defend themselves and their homes and families? Well, then the fascists have no choice but to use incredible amounts of brutal military violence to forcibly remove them, or else just round them up into camps and systemically murder them, which has precedent, as I'm sure you're aware. Or, of course, they could just give in, but I think that's unlikely. These ideas, and this ideology, is violence. Both in the sense that its followers nowadays are more than happy to enact violence upon others, and also in that were they ever to gain power, they would be more than happy to enact serious levels of mass violence upon their ideological opponents or even those who don't look like them. We don't even really need to look to the far right to see this in action. The current conservative government, which is the furthest right in recent memory, has already shown itself to be extremely willing to enact brutal violence upon those it deems subhuman, and Theresa May was hardly a fascist. Even putting aside the horrendous deportation 
expectations of British citizens, stripping undesirables of citizenship, and cozying up to Donald Trump despite opposition from both the people and MPs, including the Speaker, the cuts the current government have made to public services and the welfare state have resulted in an incredible amount of people dying. The right-wing obsession with benefit scroungers has resulted in the deaths of thousands of people as disabled people were deemed to be fit for work by people who had basically no training on disabilities and as a result were denied disability benefit and died shortly thereafter. Likewise, the spread of zero hour contracts, which allowed the government to count people who worked one hour a week as employed on their statistics, has led to a lot of people not working enough hours to afford to live and the unemployment benefit system switched from job seekers allowance to universal credit, which has been an unmitigated disaster, forcing thousands into poverty and the rise in food banks, since often these people can't even afford to eat. Almost every supermarket near me has a big collection tub for people to buy food and put in there for the less fortunate. Capitalist breadlines. And this is just standard right-wing governance. There are those who would call this moderate, which just goes to show how extreme the discourse has become in recent times, but the amount of disabled people who have been killed by the conservative government is nothing compared to the amount of people who will die due to the institutional violence of a fascist state. So, in answer to the inevitable, we shouldn't stoop to their level arguments that usually get brought up at this point, I'd like to make the simple point that debating with the far right, having them on to discuss their views, even with the express purpose of debunking them and utterly tearing them to shreds, is that they tend not to be all that affected. In fact, all it really does is just give them a larger potential audience. We've seen this from Jordan Peterson to Milo Yiannopoulos to Richard Spencer. In fact, it seems like what actually happened is that people stopped platforming them and now Milo is reduced to selling his shit on eBay at progressively lower prices and bothering people on the street in Cornwall like some kind of weird street preacher, and recently acts that have been called violence by utter imbeciles, i.e. eggy and milkshaking fascists, has done a great deal to show potential consequences of their actions, as well as to ridicule them in a thoroughly non-violent way. When it comes to Antifa or the Black Bloc, quite frankly I don't see any issues. The fascists can't be debated into submission and deplatforming only works for their speakers, not their thuggish followers, so if violence is the best way to show them all that there are consequences to their actions and ideologies, then I'm fully in support of that. After all, neo-Nazis and white nationalists regularly target black children for violence, so if knocking their teeth in will show them that their actions have severe consequences, why not? Absolutely bash the fash. I would go into more detail here, but Philosophy Tube did a great video that does exactly that, and it was about an hour long, so just go watch that instead. They declared the war on drugs, like a war on terror, but what it really did was let the police terrorize whoever, but mostly black boys, but they would call us niggas, and lay us on our belly while they fingers on their triggers, they boots was on our head, they dogs was on our crotches, and they would beat us up if we had diamonds on our wife. When is violence not violent in the eyes of a majority of people? when it's systemic. What do I mean by this? Well, allow me to explain. Is it violent to walk up to a random poor person and shoot them in the head? Most people would agree that yes, that is violent and unacceptably so. So now we take a step back and ask ourselves, what part of the interaction is violent? Is it the method of murder? Or is it the fact that I'm causing pain and death? Because depending on your answer to that question, the definition of what we might call violent is drastically different. Cards on the table, I believe it's the latter. That it's the deliberate causing of suffering and death that makes it violent, not the method. After all, it's probably not violent to shoot blanks at someone with a cap gun, right? So, now we have to seriously discuss this. If allowing, or causing people to suffer and die is violence, then what other sorts of things does that include? Who can we now decide is violent based on this information? Well, there's capitalists, police, soldiers, politicians, anyone with any level of power or authority over others, really. See, all of society is based on violence, really. Neoliberals and conservatives alike fetishise the idea of law and order, and how does that law and order come to be? Well, the primary purpose of the law is to exploit the people for the benefit of the ruling class. And how are rules imposed and enforced? How is order established? Well, by violence, of course. The police are authorised to use violence in order to maintain order, in some cases even lethal force, and with often little to no oversight or accountability. Look how fucking difficult it was to get them to wear cameras. Capitalism cannot function if the people are able to simply take what they need. The homeless must be victimised, vilified, and moved on. The starving cannot be allowed to just steal food, regardless of if they need it to live, and the relatively minimal impact such a theft would have on 
Tesco is, for example. You steal to survive, you get chased down and punished according to the perceived slight against your capitalist masters. You squat in an empty house and you'll be thrown in prison for disobeying the law and daring to want a roof over your head. Simply want to not die but are unable to pay your medical bills in the richest country on the planet? You'll be punished to the point of miserable bankruptcy until you pay it back. Laws are worthless if they are unjust, and order is worthless if it just means that we're happy to accept a terrible status quo. What we need is justice and cooperation, not law and order. How does that MLK quote go again? Oh yeah. First, I must confess that over the last few years I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counsellor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal that you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels he can set a timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I mourned the Tiananmen martyrs, whose free speech was so brutally quelled. And I cheered when Mandela walked freely After so many years in a cell But Chelsea Manning had to face justice Those secrets were not hers to tell So love me, love me, love me I'm a liberal and when we think about this even further, we can then also attribute the deaths of disability claimants who had their claims rejected to the conservative MPs who voted for the cuts, especially to the government who introduced them and, to a certain extent, even the people who voted for them. Likewise, capitalists and people who support capitalism could easily be framed as perpetrators of violence against all those living in poverty, all the children suffering and dying in the third world, all those dying of preventable means. It is for this reason that people had little to no sympathy for Theresa May as she cried during her resignation speech. She spared no tears for those she harmed, saving them all for herself, sobbing over losing her fucking job even though she's going to go on and live in luxury for the rest of her life after stripping thousands of their most fundamental rights and opportunities. This is the woman we're supposed to pity. As we see the threat changing, evolving, becoming more complex, we need to ensure that our police and our security and intelligence agencies have the powers they need. And what... Let me, let me just tell you a little bit about what I mean by that. I mean longer prison sentences for those convicted of terrorist offences. I mean making it easier for the authorities to deport foreign terrorist suspects back to their own country. And I mean doing more to restrict the freedom and movements of terrorist suspects when we have enough evidence to know they are a threat, but not enough evidence to prosecute them in full in court. And if, if our human rights laws stop us from doing it, we'll change the laws so we can do it. A woman who would prefer to curtail the rights of every citizen of the UK in order to make it easier to punish people who haven't even been proven guilty of any crime. And this man is the one we're supposed to fear? We won't defeat terrorism by ripping up our basic rights and our democracy. We defeat terrorism by our communities, by our vigilance and by police action to isolate and detain those that would wish us harm. Obviously, if somebody is a foreign national resident in Britain who is committing crimes, then clearly the law is there to take its course now. Well, if somebody presents a, a threat, then you take action against them. What I don't want is uh, executive orders where politicians can make decisions outside of the law and just decide what will happen to an individual. There has to be a judicial process. Listen, if our democracy is under threat, you strengthen your democracy in order to deal with that threat. That is a fundamental to our way of life and our society. I think Owen Jones put it best. Oh, and you say you don't have much sympathy for her? I've got less than no sympathy for her. Um, she didn't publicly break down over the victims of Windrush, who, because of her policies, were driven from their homes, denied med medical care, and even kicked out of the country. She didn't cry publicly over the, 
dozens of working class people who burned to death in Grenfell Tower. She didn't weep publicly over those who've had their benefits stripped from them, those driven to food banks because of her policies, the victims of universal credit. I think, you know, our media can often express far more sympathy for the powerful. In her case, she will lead, no doubt, a comfortable and affluent life to her very end, rather than the victims of their policies, who I'm afraid have been driven into misery, yeah. insecurity and turmoil as a direct result. You, Let's you, think you, about those people. You can't today. just respond at a human level. I have responded on a human level. I've spoken about the humanity of those who have suffered as a consequence right. of her policies. And I wish the news would give far more space to them rather than spending uh, time discussing the Prime Minister crying because she can no longer hold the most powerful job in, in the country. Make no mistake, police brutality, the threat of prisons, smashing protests, bringing out the tanks and guns, rubber bullets and water cannons is violence. As mainstream leftist dogma will remind you, there is no war but the class war that those in power wage against those without. Sometimes this does include actual wars, can't have democratically elected governments practicing socialism now, can we? But most of the time simply involves making the lives of the poor as difficult and miserable as possible in order to make sure that they're never quite able to start organising. Any rights that do exist have to be fought for in the face of this overwhelming violence and power. I could also go into the violence inherent to the military industrial complex and how little regard the West seems to have for the victims of the war it starts. As has been pointed out again and again, you don't get to complain about terrorists and refugees if you're the one who kills killed their families and blew their fucking country up in the first place. So, to return to our above hypothetical, is it more violent to walk up to a poor person and shoot them in the face? Or is it in fact more violent to normalise zero hour contracts, removing someone's ability to pay rent due to loss of income, causing them to be dragged from their home onto the street by the police, only to have their benefits cut after being incorrectly declared fit for work due to the pressure from the right to focus on benefit scroungers, and then die a few weeks later? Because make no mistake, that is not a hypothetical. It's real, it's happening, and it's more common than you might think. So next time you vote for a conservative or right-wing party, think to yourself, do you want to be personally responsible for such immense amounts of violence? So then, if our societies and our governments regularly utilise violence against us to control us, to brutalise and abuse us, what can we do about it? Well, one possible response is to fight back. After all, I think most people would agree that violence as self-defence is entirely justifiable, especially if you're an American and supported George Zimmerman and similar just acting self-defence killings of black children. So what happens when the people start to defend themselves? What happens when immigrants and refugees arm themselves and refuse to comply when the stormtroopers come to deport them and steal their children? Some to go in cages and some adopted out to white people? What happens when the homeless arm themselves and fight back when the police try to move them on? Well, as we've seen in the not too distant past, when people stand up against the violence perpetrated against them, it scares those with power. Recently a Standing Rock, where the native population stood up against the oil companies and the government who wanted to build an oil pipeline across their land, really terrified the powers that be. After all, if the people realise the power that they have, they can enact change. This has always been the case. As I mentioned in a previous video, every change, every step towards equality, every successful overthrow of an unjust system, every human or worker's right has been fought, bled and died for. The union organisers, civil rights protesters, stonewall rioters and so on laid themselves on the line and in many cases laid down their lives to fight back against oppressive systems, laws and governments. This type of violence, violence as protest, as rebellion, this kind of violence is justified and if you don't believe that then I'll take it you'll be happy to work 
work 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, with no holidays or sick pay, because if the union organisers of the past hadn't fought for your rights to better working conditions, that's what would be expected of you. If the Gestapo is sent in to drag you from your home and upend your life, you have the right to defend yourself at any cost. So many people, especially Americans online, are more than happy to argue that if the Jews had only had guns in the 30s, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened, which is bullshit by the way, whilst also condemning people, who until Trump took over were living and working legally in the USA due to the DACA and DREAM Act, fighting back against their deportation. If an entity is using violence against you, is threatening to put you and your family in a dangerous situation by, for example, deporting you to a place you would either be in danger or else struggle due to poverty or malnutrition, you are more than justified in fighting back. Whether or not it'll work out is a different question, the answer to which I'm not entirely certain on, personally. After all, the government is powerful and has a lot more firepower. But morally justifiable? Oh yes! A thousand times yes! All it takes is getting organised. Okay, so elephant in the room, yes, most of us on the left are in favour of a potentially violent workers' revolution. However, the difference there is that violence is the last resort, not the default option. What we want is for the capitalists to willingly give up their wealth, the landlords to give up their extra homes, the royal family to give up their lands, and so on and so forth. We want those with everything to share it with those without, to accept a decent life of one home, no authority, and a job that contributes to society. No hierarchy, no power over others, no obscene wealth, no poverty, no homelessness and no more struggle. This is the society we want, and we will do anything to make it happen. Every year a billion people suffer and die due to preventable means as a result of capitalism. We need to tear this unjust system down and replace it with a fairer, more egalitarian one. We don't necessarily have to do this by force, we don't want to have to seize the private property at the end of a gun, and we don't have to bring the guillotines out at all. Don't get me wrong, the urge might be there, after all, these people presided over the deaths of billions while standing by and watching, despite being more than capable of stopping it, but we are not like them. We will absolutely use violence if we have to. After all, if the only way to end poverty is by seizing the wealth by force, then quite frankly, the minimal amount of violence that might be necessary to do so would be balanced out by the end of systemic violence entirely. The problem is that people with power and wealth don't like to give it up willingly, as evidenced every single time a centre-left politician suggests an extremely mild tax increase on the super-rich, so I don't personally expect them to just turn around and willingly hand their assets over and help us build a better world. But it'll be nothing compared to the violence, pain and death the capitalists enforce upon the rest of us. Don't get me wrong, it's an easy mistake to make. We on the left are the first ones to make guillotine jokes, and some of the most famous leftist quotes are those that encourage violence. The last capitalist we hang will be the one that sells us the rope, for example. And there are definitely people out there who do want a violent revolution, but for most of us it's the last, hopefully not necessary, resort. So recently I came across this story concerning a capitalist who had his gold Porsche, and yes, you did hear that right, vandalised by a protester who simply wrote wanker across it. Now I actually empathise with this, since a system that emphasises and prioritises capital over people, that withholds essential things like food and shelter from people who cannot afford it, absolutely needs to go, and the best way to protest a system that places property over people is for people to attack that property, as we've seen with the yellow jackets in Paris. In fact, I would say that if you're going around in a gold fucking Porsche, you're basically inviting people people to write wanker on it. Of course, rather predictably, this attitude can lead to a lot of arguments and flame wars over the morality of it, so I thought I'd go over a few of the most common objections I saw whilst researching the story and this issue in general. How is choosing to spend your money inviting people to vandalise your property? Because deciding to display your disgusting wealth whilst others starve and die is the quickest way of saying I don't give a shit about children living in poverty because I got lucky. It's the vehicular equivalent of putting up a vote conservative poster in your window. It's a great way of letting people know that you care so much more about yourself and your own personal wealth than people actually suffering, and may as well just say, I require bricks through my windows, please. You don't know what kind of person he is. Maybe he gives to charity. He's the sort of person who buys a gold Porsche, aka cares a huge deal about showing off his ostentatious wealth. Maybe he does give to charity, but clearly he doesn't give enough. If he has enough left over to buy a gold Porsche, and doesn't care enough to, you know, not show off about all his disgusting wealth, rather than giving that money away. So if someone saw you with 
for example, a new video game, took it from you and smashed it, that's fair because you asked for it. Okay, I don't actually play video games, or at least I haven't since I sold my Xbox 360 in 2015, but the person who originally said this to me when I brought it up wasn't to know that, and rather than be pedantic, I'm happy to assume for a moment that that isn't the case. The answer is no, because buying a new video game, one, doesn't cost more than a house, and that money couldn't be used to realistically have any huge impact on poverty at large. Two, has more utility than being a symbol to show off how rich I am whilst others live off food banks because they don't have enough money to buy enough food to survive otherwise. It's not the same at all. The rich could use their wealth to benefit society in ways the rest of us can't, and there is a clear material difference between having the ability to help but choosing instead to buy a gold Porsche, aka the rich, e.g. this guy, and simply not being able to, aka everyone else. Sure, £50, that's how much video games cost now, right? Can feed one person for maybe a few days. But £100,000 can house someone living on the streets, potentially turning their lives around. There is a clear difference there. People have the right to spend their wealth as they see fit. Sure, they do have that right, but that is absolutely a bad thing, and ties into our earlier conversation about law and order. They have the right to do that through law, but that doesn't mean everyone has to agree or that it is morally right. When the super rich can choose to end poverty forever but choose not to, forgive me for not really caring about their right to spend their own money. Judging someone for buying a gold Porsche rather than helping people in need is absolutely fair, in my opinion. Oh okay, so we just shouldn't buy nice things then. I take it in the past you have bought nice clothes, etc. Actually, I haven't really. I buy shirts that fit and basically wear them until I can't anymore. I guess if I go somewhere nice I wear a bustin' up shirt, but all my clothes are cheap as fuck. This is a matter of jealousy. You're justifying vandalism of possessions because someone else has them and you don't. No, in this hypothetical where I'm the one who vandalised the car, which I didn't but I would have no moral objections to doing so, I would be happy to choose to vandalise this guy's possessions because he clearly values said items more than people. Allowing children to die in poverty is not a crime, but damaging property is? Sounds like a broken system to be honest. Maybe someone should do something about that. You're judging someone you haven't even met, that's unfair. He's not the one who broke the law by vandalising someone else's property. Is it not fair to judge by his actions? He could have chosen to spend that money to help people, but instead decided to use it to make a statement. I have more than you and I don't care about your suffering. We live under a system where people starve and die because we value property and capital over human lives. Vandalising that property is a direct form of protest against this injustice. Why are the property rights of the super rich more important than the human rights of the poor? Also, something being illegal doesn't make it wrong, that's not how morality works. Slavery was legal at one point and protesting against it was not. Women voting was illegal and so was trying to change that. If the people making the breaking the law is a moral argument were around in the 1800s, would they have decried abolitionists or people who helped free slaves because the property rights of the plantation owners superseded the human rights of the slaves? And if not, why do they believe that allowing children to die due to choosing not to help is an acceptable position to take? So you're victim blaming then. The victim is not the rich guy, it's the children he allowed to die by an action, so no. Okay then, so what should people like this give away? A percentage of their earnings or something? Whatever it is, I take it you already give that amount. He should give himself enough to live a decent life and give the rest away. That's why if I ever get rich, I'm giving myself a salary of at most 30k a year and donating the rest. No one needs billions or even millions whilst others have nothing. I don't currently have enough to donate as much as I'd like, however I do occasionally volunteer to help feed the homeless to make up for it. It should work like this every penny above enough to live a decent life should be given away or possibly taken away. I'm afraid I must ask again, why is the property of the rich more important than the lives of the poor? If someone allows children to die due to greed, then that person is pretty objectively in the wrong. I really don't understand how anyone can not believe that. What exactly does this achieve though? It shows the rich that they cannot continue to exploit and harm the working people with impunity, and that they are not as safe doing so as they think. Protesting against an unjust system absolutely does change things. The history of workers' rights is littered with acts of violence against the system that kept the working people down. Thank violent union protesters for your right to days off and sick pay, not the people who sat around taking the abuse, licking the boots. Oh, so you're one of these kill the rich types, are you? Those poor rich kids you want to murder. Sorry, I don't recall saying that I think rich children should die, merely that billionaires shouldn't exist and that property damage is not in any way comparable to violence. Allowing children to die by an action, though. That is absolutely a form of violence. You do realise that objects are less important than human lives, right? Or are they, in your mind? Sitting around doing nothing whilst injustice takes place is not going to do anything. The only way to enact change is through direct action. If the super rich were actually helping, and actually used their enormous wealth to end poverty, then perhaps we would be having a different conversation, but poverty still exists, despite them being able to end it forever, so clearly the current system does not work. This is why I view the rich as inherently evil. They are 
are aware of and in some cases actively cause the injustices inherent in capitalism but do nothing to rectify them, choosing instead to focus on personal gain. You lefties are all the same, it's no good condoning criminal actions, why not just shoplift instead of buying things if you're that laissez-faire about laws? Why is shoplifting from major corporations bad but allowing children to die is not? I know I'm sounding like a broken record here but don't get me wrong, maybe shoplifting from a charity shop or something is shitty but from Tesco's or Primark or something, I'd have no issue with that. It's not like it would affect anyone but the people who wouldn't notice the loss. Why is it more important that the law be followed rather than people act in accordance with their own moral codes? The law is designed to protect the powerful and persecute the powerless. Forgive me if I don't lose any sleep over not following the letter of the law 100% of the time. I promise this is the last time I bring up the slavery analogy but if you were around in the 19th century would you have condemned people who helped slaves escape from slavery? Because that would have been criminal behaviour too. Rather amusingly I asked my local police force this question and they were worried reticent to rule it out. We need law and order. What, are you suggesting we just start bricking the windows of conservative supporters? What if it was your grandmother? Not advocating for it, but if you support a political party that victimises and murders the poor and vulnerable, the amount of disabled people who have died after having their benefits cut alone is disgusting, then yes, quite frankly, fuck you. I would absolutely not condemn bricking that house. If you're willing to advocate for the pseudo-genocide of disabled people, then you absolutely deserve it. My beloved grandmother, who was the closest I had to a best friend throughout most of my childhood, who despite the 30 year age gap I had a surprisingly close relationship with, recently passed away, but before she died she was an anti-capitalist, though she would never have described herself as such. She organised union meetings in the 60s and 70s, was proud of her father for doing the same in the 40s and 50s, and was well aware of the powerlessness that working people have in our society, so I wouldn't really have to worry about that. I suppose the thing to take away from this is that if you're not a selfish monster who supports the deliberate murder of the most vulnerable people in our society, you don't have anything to worry about, just like if you're not a fascist, you have nothing to fear from Antifa. I hope this video has, if not actually changed your mind, then at least made you think a little more deeply about violence as an idea, and in particular the areas where it both is and isn't acceptable, and the extent of what could be called violence. We cannot allow our squeamishness about violence to cause us to enable the rise of the far right. We cannot allow ourselves to ignore the incredible amount of violence inherent in capitalism, hierarchy and imperialism simply because it's not so direct and obvious. We cannot act as if resorting to violence in order to prevent further suffering and death is in any way comparable to allowing these unjust systems to continue as they are. And finally, we cannot see vandalism as an act of violence when we live in a society that places more value in possessions than people. It's nothing more than an act of righteous protest. If it takes a violent revolution to end a much more violent system of oppression, then so be it. I'm okay with that, though I can't guarantee I'll last long, I'm not much of a fighter, but I wouldn't mind dying in the workers' revolution to be honest. There are much worse ways to die and at least I'll be dying for something worthwhile. It's only a matter of time before I kill myself anyway, going by the way capitalism is fucked with my mental health, so why not die fighting to make the world a better place. I was probably never going to be able to retire anyway the way things are going. 74? Fuck right off. We've got the right to choose it There ain't no way we'll lose it This is our life This is our song We'll fight the powers that be just Don't pick our destiny cause You don't know us, you don't belong